Hello and welcome to Star Diary, the podcast from the makers of BBC Sky at Night magazine. You can subscribe to the digital edition of the magazine by visiting iTunes, Google Play or Apple News, or to the print edition by visiting skyatnightmagazine.com. Greetings listeners, and welcome to Star Diary, a weekly guide to the best things to see in the Northern Hemisphere's night sky. As we are based here in the UK, all times are in GMT. In this episode, we'll be covering the coming week from the 20th to the 26th of January. I'm Features Editor Ezzy Pearson, and I'm joined this week by astronomy writer Katrin Rayner. Hello, Katrin. Hi, Ezzy. It's nice to be back. It is. It's nice to see you again as well. So what do we have to look forward to in this week's night sky? Well, we have the moon at Apogee this week, and it will be pairing up with Speaker in the early morning sky. And Venus and Saturn are a planetary pair to still enjoy. And we also have the Gamma Ursae Minorid Meteor Shower happening. And it's burned tonight on the 25th. You know I love a themed occasion. So um, bringing a very famous nebula discovered by a Scottish astronomer, which with a caveat is a challenge. So um, yeah, it's, it's not we for everyone. We do like a challenge occasionally. It's how you stretch yourself, how you grow as an astronomer. This is very true. Yeah, so let's have at it. Let's see what we've got coming up. Okay, well, you have to wait till the end for that. So yeah, we'll get through the week first. (laughs) So the moon is waning all week. It's going to be at last quarter on the 21st. And on the 21st, the bright star extremely close to the moon is Spica, the brightest star in Virgo. So the two are going to rise in the early hours of the morning. They will remain close to each other until dawn. And as the moon moves in its orbit, Spica will be to the left of the moon as they rise and then will be positioned to its right as they disappear into the dawn. And any observers in Africa will enjoy watching a lunar occultation of Speaker, but unfortunately won't be visible this far north, but it'll still be lovely to see the two in this dance in the morning sky. So that'll be something well worth looking out for. And the moon is it's also at Apogee today, the 21st, so it's going to be at its furthest point from Earth, around 400,000 kilometres away. And just for interest and kind of reference, when the moon is at perigee, so close to us, its approximate distance is 356,000 kilometres. So it's quite a large distance between the two there, Ezzy. And yeah, I also kind of missed out a digit when I was writing up my notes. I was like, wow, 35,000 kilometres from us. That's really close. <laughs> I think I think if it got to 35,000 kilometers from us, there would be some other issues that we were having. <laughs> I've read various things over the years of like what would happen if the moon got closer to us. And the answer is not good things. Not good. No. <laughs> um, massive tidal waves, sort of huge possible like earthquakes and seismic oh, gosh, activity yeah. as the, the moon's gravitational pull is quite strong. Um, <laughs> So I, yeah, I put the extra digit back in just so I don't want to yeah, panic people. Yeah, that's good. People, that's so. good. <laughs> yeah, it's not going to be 35,000 kilometers. Let's, let's not flood most of Earth by accidentally mistyping a digit. Moving on to the 25th. We'll still be around by then, don't worry. The 19% lit waning moon can be located near Antares this morning. So the moon will rise at 5.20 a.m., by which time Antares will already have risen around 20 minutes beforehand. Now, Antares is the brightest star in the constellation of Scorpius, and it's often referred to as the heart of the Scorpion because of its reddish appearance. And at around half past six then, the moon will just be five degrees above the southeastern horizon, whilst Antares is a little higher, positioned eight degrees above the southeastern horizon. So yeah, so with the sun not rising until just a little after 8 a.m., you have kind of got a good enough window of opportunity to see the two together if you're up and about at that time. So solar system wise, tiny little Mercury is at at Helion on the 19th. So it's furthest point from the sun this afternoon uh, around just after 2 p.m. And of course, not visible to us. But as we say, Mercury doesn't really get much coverage, does it sometimes? So yes, you might not be able to see it, but you'll know. You'll know that it's exactly at Helion. Yes, we can. Now we know how Pluto feels, perhaps. You know, Pluto's not a planet and Mercury doesn't get get much attention. No. (laughs) Poor little thing. It's because it keeps hiding. It must be a shy planet. Yeah. (laughs) So, yeah, I I can't remember when we see Mercury next, actually. Well, I'm sure we'll cover it in the future issues of Star Keep listening to the podcast and we'll make sure to inform you when Mercury's coming back. The messengers of Mercury. It could be a, a new podcast. 
Um, on the 20th, we have a conjunction of Venus and Saturn at 5.15 in the morning, but the pair set around 9 p.m. the night before, so in the Northern Hemisphere, we're not going to see them at the time of conjunction, but on the night of the 20th, as you would expect, both planets will be visible in the sky in the southwest as the darkness creeps on in. So it's been great having Venus and Saturn in the evening sky the past few months. I've loved seeing them both together. It's been really lovely. But yes, as, you know, we also have Jupiter. It's within the constellation of Taurus. And on the 20th, its largest moon, Ganymede, transits the gas giant just after half past six in the evening and ends at just before 9 p.m., so Ganymede's shadow will be visible transiting the planet later from 10.30 p.m. and concluding at 1.20 a.m. on the 21st. So the moon will transit Jupiter at half past six, but we won't see the shadow of the moon or Ganymede until half past ten, so much later on. I did actually, I will admit, Azzy, I couldn't really get my head around that, why there was a four-hour delay. Yeah, I'm trying to work that one out as well. I mean, I can understand, like the, I mean, sometimes it's just, you know, it's the angles that the shadows are at that it takes a moment for because the shadow is actually falling quite a bit behind the planet. Yes, so I actually just used, you know, a piece of software or that was available on the internet because I was like, I can't, figure out why there is this delay but like you said I think it's just the angle maybe the position of the sun as well also we haven't talked a lot there's been quite a few shadow transits that we've talked about in previous episodes but Ganymede isn't one of the ones that tends to come up as often I'm trying to remember the order of my Galilean moons I think Ganymede is the third furthest out so that's like it's got more distance to, to so that angle builds up so Io's shadow because it's so much closer to Jupiter, its shadow will appear closer to, to Io. Io is the one that's closest into the, the planet. I can remember that one because that's why it's all volcanic and horrible. And then like, as you get further and further away, the shadows sort of have enough time and enough distance that, that they will fall further away from where they would be if the sun was directly in line with the planet. Okay, yeah, I mean, like I said, I was scratching my head the other day trying to get my head around this. So until I visualised it on a screen... I, but I was still kind of finding it very hard to explain as to why there was this delay. Yeah, four hours does still seem like a lot. It's a long time, <laughs> yeah. So one to look out for and one to go away and research about as well, I think. So, yeah. So on the 21st, speaking of Pluto, as we did, you know, maybe a few minutes ago, we have minor planet Pluto at solar conjunction. Now, it's extremely close to the sun, around three degrees of separation. And at this time, it's also at its furthest point from Earth at 36 astronomical units away it's so far away but yeah I never never talk about Pluto and it's not something I particularly read up on either so I was quite interested to read something about Pluto yeah Pluto is there is a reason it wasn't discovered until 1930 you do need a fairly hefty telescope to be able to see it you're not going to be able to see it with you know sort of a couple of inches refractor telescope you need a bit of a light bucket a whopper but it's a challenge. A challenge, yes. We do enjoy a challenge, don't we? So and Mars is visible all week. It rises in the afternoon and sets the following morning. So basically, we will be able to enjoy the red planet all night long. It's going to be very high above the southern horizon at midnight each night, reaching an altitude of 63 degrees. Saturn still visible all week after the sun has set. And it's still seen close to bright Venus in the southwest. And it starts to set by the time the week is out, just before 9 p.m., and if you compare this to the end of December, Saturn was setting just after 10 p.m. So that, you know, there's now quite, well, there's now nearly an hour's difference in seeing it in the sky as it's setting earlier. And all week, Neptune is edging closer to Venus as Venus moves upwards in the sky. So a few more planets to, uh, to keep an eye out for. Meteor shower wise, I didn't know whether to put this in or not because it's not very exciting, I'll be honest, Desi. <laughs> But also, well, I thought, well, you know, if people are out and they see some meteors or shooting stars, they might wonder what it is. So on the night of the 19th into the 20th, we have the Gamma Ursae Minorid meteor shower. It peaks, but it really isn't a meteor shower to get excited about, it's, as the zenithal hourly rate is very low at only three. Yeah. And as we always have to say, whenever we're talking about the ZHR, the zenithal hourly rate, 
that is under perfect conditions if you were looking directly up if it was perfectly dark if the sky was amazingly clear you would expect to see three every hour the actual number you see is usually about a quarter of that so you might catch one of these every hour but if you do see a shooting star when you're out and about maybe trace back its path and see if you can trace it back to Ursa Minor and maybe you were lucky enough and you did catch one of these. Yes. And, you know, we also have a waning gibbous moon, which is going to make it even harder to see. Um, but as, as you said, you know, if you are out observing and you do see one, then, well, yeah, it could be a gamma Ursa Minorid meteor. So, yeah, like I said, I wasn't sure where to mention or not. I'm not sure if it's something that we even talk about because it is so low. But again, interesting to know that these things happen and and that it's there, I suppose. But don't cancel your plans on the 19th to go out and see these. <laughs> and I'm just going to end with the deep sky. Um, you know, I mentioned at the beginning, you know, the 25th of January is, of course, Burns Night. So, Ezzy, I couldn't find any Scottish-themed constellations to bring in. You know, there was no haggis or bagpipe. Oh, that's, that is a shame. I'm surprised there's no bagpipe constellation. I would imagine that that is something that you could make a series of stars into being. but Possibly. Yeah, unfortunately, no haggises, no bagpipes. But there are plenty of notable Scottish astronomers, including the brilliant Wilhelmina Fleming. Absolutely. Yes, what a lady. And she discovered the Horsehead Nebula in 1888 when studying a photographic plate. And she was actually born in Dundee, which is a city close to my heart. A lot of my family are there. You know, they, they were born there and my grandmother is still there. My parents still live on the outskirts. So, yay, Dundee. <laughs> I I do love Wilhelmina Fleming. She was part of a team that were called the Harvard Computers back when computers was the word for the people who did all of the maths and all of the calculations because they didn't have computers. So if you wanted to work out the position you had to, of a star on a photographic plate, you had to do a whole bunch of trigonometry. And the Harvard professor at the time, called Pickering, he got so annoyed with all of the male astronomers who didn't want to do this work because they thought it was too boring and it wasn't real astronomy, that he reportedly said, you guys are so rubbish, my Scottish maid could do better. Oh, my gosh. And his Scottish maid, it turned out, which was a, a bit of a dismissive comment. She was working as his maid at the time, but she was also a very educated woman who had shown a lot of skill at doing mathematics. And so she came on board which led to a whole bunch of women being employed at Harvard. People like Henrietta Swan Leavitt, Annie Jump Cannon, which is one of my favourite names ever, who made incredible contributions to astronomy and did all of this work incredibly well and were very, very dedicated to collecting all of these plates together. So yes, Wilhelmina Fleming, a very, very cool astronomer. Yes, it's really incredible. I mean, like, I just couldn't imagine even doing something like that in this day and age. I've done some of the work back when I was doing my undergraduate degree because they make you do it as like a practical lesson so that you know how to do it. And yeah, I can, <laughs> <laughs> I can see why some of the other astronomers were like, no, I don't really want to do that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's not a job for me, thanks. <laughs> Oh, no, it's, it's amazing. Her story is incredible. And yes, to discover this nebula, you know, which is, it's iconic now, isn't it? This The images you see of the Horsehead Nebula, it's, it's really incredible. So, yeah, you know, just briefly, this nebula is a small dark nebula in the constellation of Orion, and it's located just to the south of Alnitak, the easternmost star of Orion's belt. Unfortunately, it's not that easy to find it. I, you know, I made it sound very easily. And yes, there is an excellent guide on the Sky and Night website if you want to try and locate the Horsehead Nebula. And I, I love that the author had written, it's a tricky task, but achievable. And I thought, I really like that. I'm going to use that in everyday life now. It's a tricky task, but it's achievable. And yeah, Orion is very visible at this time of year, so locating Elm Attack will be very easy. And that is the starting point. So on the 25th, Burns Night... Orion can be spotted at 35 degrees above the Southern Hemisphere at 10 p.m., which I think is the highest position it'll reach at this time. Now, I haven't seen it, Ezzy. I haven't even tried to see it. 
that research about observing this nebula suggests a 12 inch scope is the minimum size to observe it. So, you know, you're going to have to have a good piece of equipment there to have a bash and try and get out of the way of any light pollution. So yeah, it's a great challenge for the new year. And a good Scottish theme, a good Scottish female astronomer. So It is also one of the more famous nebula out there, despite the fact that it's not the most obvious in the world. It is. Yeah, like I said, you know, it's so iconic, isn't it? All the pictures you can see now of, of it. And I think it's instantly recognisable. So, yeah, but if, if you don't fancy that challenge, if you just want to get out on the 25th, now is a really good time to look for the winter triangles as it's visible for much of the night in the winter months and no equipment's needed. It's an asterism formed of three bright stars in Orion, Canis Major and Canis Minor. So you, if you can locate bright Betelgeuse and Orion... Procyon in Canis Minor and Dazzling Sirius in Canis Major, then you've managed to locate the sparkly winter triangle. So, yeah. Well, I think that's a, a lovely way to finish out the week and a lovely challenge to go after. Thank you very much for everybody at home for listening. If you would like even more stargazing highlights, please do subscribe to the podcast and we'll be back here next week, this time with Mary McIntyre, our other presenter. To summarise that week again, on the 19th, Mercury is going to be at Hapelion. Unfortunately, it won't be visible to us, but still, it's good to know that it's there. On the 19th into the 20th, you'll also be able to see the Gamma Ursid Minorid Meteor Shower, which will reach its peak then, but it's not the most prolific in the world, so don't expect to see too much. On the 20th, there's a conjunction between Venus and Saturn in the early morning, but due to their setting times, we won't see them at the time of conjunction. But it is still a good time to look at the two together close on the night sky. What we will see that night is Ganymede transiting Jupiter. On the 21st, the moon is at first quarter and bright star speaker will be extremely close to the moon. The moon is also at apogee and the minor planet Pluto is also at solar conjunction. On the 25th, it's a great chance to see the moon near to the heart of the Scorpion Antares. For those with medium to larger telescopes who fancy a challenge, why not try to locate the Horsehead Nebula in Orion in honour of Burns Knight and Scottish astronomer Wilhelmina Fleming? And throughout the week, Mars, Saturn, Neptune and Uranus are all going to be visible. And why not take a look out for the Winter Triangle using your naked eyes as well? From all of us here at Sky Night magazine, goodbye. If you want to find out even more spectacular sights that will be gracing the night sky this month, be sure to pick up a copy of BBC Sky at Night magazine, where we have a 16-page pull-out sky guide with a full overview of everything worth looking up for throughout the whole month. Whether you like to look at the moon, the planets or the deep sky, whether you use binoculars, telescopes or neither, our sky guide has got you covered with detailed star charts to help you track your way across the night sky. From all of us here at BBC Sky at Night magazine, goodbye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Star Diary podcast from the makers of BBC Sky at Night magazine. For more of our podcasts, visit our website at skyatnightmagazine.com slash podcasts or head to Spotify, iTunes or your favourite podcast player. Mm-hmm.